All right, welcome. Hey, thank you for uh, coming. This is the last session of the day. Uh, it's been a long day. I'm glad they finally got the ventilation system working. Um, we're here to talk about large capital projects in DOE. As you all know, um, DOE EMs, uh, capital projects are large, complex, take a lot of time, big investment. Um, and one of the things is they get a lot of scrutiny. Um, and with that scrutiny comes a lot of involvement from communities, a lot of involvement from uh, stakeholders, and uh, obviously a lot of oversight from Congress, uh, the GAO, uh, regulators, um, and, and, and typically involve a uh, level of diligence and rigor um, that uh, I think all of our contractors employ. Um, and with that, um, to get things started, John McWilliams, and let's uh, get to show on roll. Thanks. Okay. Good. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm John McWilliams. I'm Associate Deputy Secretary at, at the uh, department, and uh, I'm here today with uh, Katie Satorius, who's a special advisor to the secretary, also works with me in, in this uh, area. Um, I must say, looking around the room, uh, even those that are still outside, uh, I feel like I know half of you, and in fact, about 25% of you I was with last week at Hanford, so <laughs> I feel like we've just transported uh, uh, back here. Um, I have, a, for those of you that I, that I haven't met, I have a, a private sector background in uh, energy finance and project management throughout most of my career, uh, focused on energy since about the mid-80s, uh, and I, I joined the department uh, with the secretary I've known for, for many years, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, my portfolio uh, is, uh, is fairly broad, so I focus on everything from being a, a, his senior finance advisor to project management. Uh, uh, recently, uh, for some reason, we added the chief risk officer title to that, so we're trying to figure out what that's all about. Um, and then uh, also do some national security and cybersecurity uh, work um, as, as well. But today, <clears throat> I'm here uh, to talk about uh, project management and management of our, of our large um, capital uh, projects. Um, and, and also, I really want to thank all my DOE uh, colleagues who are here, uh, the Energy Communities Alliance and the Energy uh, Facility Contractors Group for, for hosting this, our first event. Um, I think this is really uh, an important event, and I, I look forward to doing this um, in, the, in the future. Um, you know, the department, and you all know this, but we have a, a very um, unique uh, job, the legacy of cleaning up from the Cold War uh, to constructing really unique uh, facilities for pathbreaking uh, research um, to deliver results. And we're often doing things that um, have never been done uh, before. And so I've had the... Um, the pleasure of working with a number of you on a wide range of our projects. As I mentioned last week, I spent the whole week at Hanford uh, and was able to, to tour the facility, um, all the facilities and the lab. Um, and I have to say, uh, and also I, 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 was, um, I got to witness one of our peer reviews, which I'll come back to in a second, is really an important thing. And I was really impressed with the quality of the people that I saw uh, and the folks that are committed to the mission. Um, at the risk of being a little bit maudlin, I really found myself thinking that uh, we live in a, in, a, in a great country where we are so dedicated to spending decades, enormous number of resources with people and talent to clean up uh, the, really from the legacy of the Manhattan Project and the Cold War, which were very important national missions. And that we really owe this, as one of the uh, folks I think on Peggy's uh, staff might have mentioned when we were there, we really owe this uh, not only to the, to the country, but to the states, um, the, the tribes uh, affected, the communities, particularly the people whose families uh, gave uh, several generations ago to those efforts. And so um, yeah, I think we're very lucky. Not all countries that are in, uh, would, would do this. And so I think that's something to be proud of. And that also, it really gets lost sometimes when we are focused understandably on, on the problems that we face. Um, we um, have, as I think you know, been spending a lot of time since the Secretary got here focusing on revising and improving our project management, particularly with respect to our large capital uh, projects. Uh, it's no surprise to any of you um, that we've had our challenges in the past. Uh, there are things that we should have done better and that we will do better in the future, but we also have a very, very complex mission, first of a kind uh, and of a scale that's really unsurpassed elsewhere uh, practically uh, in the world. 
Um, Secretary Moniz, who was here uh, this morning, uh, talked about some of the things that he put in place right when he got here, um, and very important, created an office of the uh, Undersecretary for Management and Performance, uh, which uh, is um, a very important effort to improve our project management. Um, as I joined with him, uh, knowing my background, he asked me to uh, lead a group uh, to uh, look at some of our project management and try to uh, sort of get to the ground truth of, of what's happened in the past. And so uh, I pulled together a group. Um, several of them are, are here today. I think Jack Schrass is in the back there, and there may be others in the room as well. Uh, you know, I, I picked the six, eight people who are the most experienced senior people in DOE and project management. Um, got in a room once a week for a better part of a year and really uh, encouraged candor and uh, to a person uh, They really stepped up and were very honest and candid and we uh, issued a report um, Which is also as you'll see it on our website very candid uh, and then we uh, moved from there after briefing the secretary uh, at his direction we created a project management a risk committee uh, where uh, those same people sit on the committee which I chair and we now have a process where all projects of any meaningful size come up through the Project Management Risk Committee as they go through these various CD uh, stages. And um, I think that's a very important uh, change we've made. It will be enduring. It's structural now. It's mandated by the Secretary. And the idea is to try to catch early on some of these problems we've had. So you can pick your favorite big prob uh, project we've had problems with, but you see similar things in the past, design build, immature design. Um, unclear uh, who the project owner is and so I'm, as I'm fond of saying when everybody's in charge nobody's in charge so we've put in uh, true accountability in place uh, every undersecretary now uh, has designated for every project who the project owner is and there's a clean line uh, of accountability uh, to that uh, which is very important uh, we've also in addition this group is looking at uh, 413 um, B and we are going through line by line and looking at places we believe we should change. We are very cognizant of um, uh, the various folks that, that obviously um, have been regulating us and the suggestions that have been uh, made there as well. So we've been trying to uh, in, improve that. Um, last thing I'll touch on is uh, as part of this, we have our energy uh, systems uh, acquisition advisory board, our ESAB. Some of you are, are probably familiar with that. Um, and it's been in, in place for a few years, but frankly, it had become a bit static uh, and a little bit pro forma and was only really focused on very large projects, 750 million and up. So what we've tried to do uh, in mirroring uh, things we've done in other parts of the department, such as the loan program office, is make that a dynamic organization um, that reports to the deputy secretary um, and now um, uh, convenes uh, regularly everything that's $100 million uh, and up or anything that the Project Management Risk Committee deems to be at risk. Uh, we have, uh, have had several meetings recently and we have two more, in fact, uh, next week. Uh, and so that's really a kind of a, a completely revised um, uh, organization now. Um, the final thing I would mention uh, is that the Secretary did issue uh, in June, uh, based on all the recommendations from the Project Management Risk Committee, uh, a new secretarial um, memo on project management policies and principles. Uh, and in there, we go through a number of other uh, improvements. And specifically, uh, Dave, Dave Trimble's not here today, but um, we've spent a lot of time with GAO, and they are very thoughtful. Um, uh, in their oversight and in their understanding of projects. They've, they've obviously been critical of us in the past, but in a very constructive way. Um, we are pleased that we have made progress in um, moving a number of uh, projects off the high-risk li list, but some of the changes that you will see mandated specifically uh, conform. For example, under our cost estimating, we're now going to utilize methods um, uh, and best practices for cost estimating that are consistent with GAO's cost estimating and assessment uh, guide. And you'll see other requirements there uh, as well. So uh, with that, I'll leave it because I'm sure we'll, we'll have questions. But again, I really want to thank all of you because uh, you know th this mission, uh, cleaning up uh, this, this waste, this legacy waste, is really an important uh, mission to the nation. And, and uh, you're all the ones doing it. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ken Pika.
Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Tank Waste. Um, Ken has a broad, long background in uh, various capital projects inside DOE, and uh, welcome. So um, about 20 some odd years ago, just started work at, uh, at DOE and I was working in something called the Vitrification Projects Branch. It was a, uh, a group that was in DOE under uh, Mark Fry at the time. I saw Mark earlier, I don't know if he's in the audience right now. And um, we didn't have federal project directors at the time. We had uh, federal project managers at headquarters, which is sort of a weird concept, but I remember after about, after I was on the job for probably about a year, maybe a little more, and the, the, that person who was the federal program manager for the Defense Waste Processing Facility left to go to Savannah River. And so they turned to me and said, okay, you got it. So uh, I've been doing this uh, for a while, and that was when my hair was brown. So uh, I've got some uh, aging <laughs> scars to go with uh, some of that experience. Um, for today's talk, um, I'm glad John talked about and set the framework because I think I'm going to sort of dovetail from, from what, what he did. Um, I actually talked with Jack Sarash and said, managing large capital projects. Obviously, in, in, uh, we have probably the largest in EM uh, with the waste treatment plant and the salt waste processing facility, but Frank uh, Shepard spoke about, uh, at least I think he did, I wasn't able to make it over here this morning, he was supposed to talk about SWPF and some of the successes we're expecting in 2016, and I imagine, Peggy, you're going to touch on WTP. So I'm not really going to touch about those. I'm going to, I'm going to more talk about how we're implementing the framework that, that John mentioned uh, for some of our other projects and some of the experience in that regard. Um, but first, just sort of uh, some background and setting the scene. Um, this is a uh, typical slide that we use when we present our budget. This is the 2016 budget. And so you can see the, the various functional areas that uh, comprise that budget, of which uh, you can see the, on the left there, uh, radioactive tank waste is the biggest component at uh, more than uh, $2 billion. And out of that, uh, I just wanted to show what the projects were uh, that we're funding in that area in FY16. And you can see that that's about almost a billion uh, when you look at now. Some of those are at Savannah River and some of those are at, at Hanford. Um, so we've got a, a, an equal mix. Uh, and I will talk about some of those projects as we go forward. Uh, I do have one slide on WTP and SWPF just to... Uh, talk, talk about the current, the, the projects we have that are in, in construction. So um, salt waste processing facility and uh, as I know Frank talked about how they're moving forward to complete construction um, by the end of 2016 and they're on, on path right now to exceed that, uh, that date and actually come in probably under the estimated budget for that. Uh, and then they've also started, I know Pam and her folks um, started working with the contractor on their commissioning uh, approaches, and uh, we're, we're very hopeful that uh, we've got a good baseline now, since we rebaselined in August, to, to move forward and, and make that a success. Um, in fact, we want to exceed both the uh, schedule by actually two years. We want to exceed the CD4 date. Um, and we're actually planning that, and that goes into our liquid waste management systems, a, a date that, that is two years before CD4, and we expect to have some cost savings uh, in that regard as well. Uh, on the waste treatment plant, the uh, emphasis right now is on trying to achieve some treatment capability as soon as we can. To do that, we have, we thought, we developed a uh, framework that eventually morphed into a, a process that uh, uh, our consent decree approach to our consent decree with the state of Washington was to look at um, the direct feed approach and get some treatment capability as quickly as we can using the three, the two facilities that we show there, the low activity waste vitrification facility, the anical laboratory, and then there's a bunch of other facilities you can see as uh, Monica calls it the WTP city. Uh, 
the, the so-called balance of facilities, and we need a number of those to be uh, successful in, in being able to get that facility up and going, and we're targeting a, a 2022 date uh, by, by, to have that in place. One of our other projects that um, is uh, over the $100 million threshold, and it was already in CD3 when um, the uh, Secretary's project initiative came into being, is the salt zone disposal unit. This is a, a 30 million gallon capability. This is a picture. The diameter is 375 feet. So for a baseball analogy, that's uh, basically home plate to uh, right center or left center field and about 40 feet high. And uh, we're hoping to bring this project in. Right now we're expecting to bring that project in under cost and ahead of schedule as well. Um, now, that's going to be something that we're going to be needing seven more of those to complete the mission. But the good news is that we started with a smaller facility, about three million gallons. And as we were looking at what could we do to potentially uh, save the program some funds, uh, somebody at the site came up with this approach to uh, come up with a, uh, I'm keying back to the innovation discussions that for that Mark and others were on the last panel. That was an innovative approach. It really didn't involve a whole lot of technology development. This was a concept that the uh, domestic water industry uses for uh, large-scale uh, tanks. But I will mention one thing here. Uh, we did have a little bit of a hiccup with one of the subs on this. They weren't used to doing nuclear jobs, and so getting into an NQA-1 kind of environment uh, was a little bit, uh, took a little bit of time to get into that, but uh, they were finally able to make that happen. So, um, so moving forward, um, these are some of the main tenets. I think John discussed some of these. Um, for uh, for projects prior to CD1, we want to do independent review of alternatives. Uh, that's something done not by the contracting agency or by by the. Uh, uh, organization that's responsible for ultimately operating the facility. It's supposed to be independent, and I'll talk about a specific example that we did there. Uh, attain a technology readiness level of six prior to CD2, and perform design reviews at 30 percent and 90 percent. And then also, um, we've uh, been, uh, a number of our projects have been before the Project Management Risk Committee. Um, and I'll talk about that specifically with relative to one of those. And then, as John said, the reconstituted ESAB. We've uh, had uh, several briefings on WTP, if I remember right, and one on SWPF. So, um, low activity waste pretreatment system. This is a new project that will be needed to be able to make the direct feed law concept happen while we're completing resolution of technical issues on the pretreatment facility. I won't get into the details of, of this other than to say it will allow the low activity waste uh, vitrification facility to operate at the 30, gallon, uh, 30 metric tons per day of, of glass per day. So that's what the, the capability is intended to provide. But I wanted to talk about more of the application implementation of the Secretary's project management activities. So one of the things we did do is we, we did charter an independent group. This was even before the uh, initiative, I think, uh, was uh, formally implemented and uh, worked with Kevin and some folks at uh, headquarters to put together a team. It was led by somebody from Savannah River, and we had folks from industry and academia come in and take a look at a number of different options for the technologies. Um, and as they were working their way through that, it ultimately they uh, recommended that we can we continue with what at the time was the contractor's recommendation for for both uh, filtration and the uh, uh, cesium removal, and they made uh, that report available to us. Um, we did have some, as we were getting into discussions with the Project Management Risk Committee, they had a couple recommendations with respect to the ensuring the technology readiness level was going to get up to a, a level of six, and um, also that um, um, that we had a CD2, uh, prior to CD2, excuse me. And so uh, one of the things that we ended up doing, or are doing, is implementing a large-scale technology demonstration activity so we can achieve that 
achieve that date. And then uh, this fall, we're going to be doing the 30% uh, design review of this facility. Another facility that uh, just uh, had approved the CD0, the uh, mission need, was a facility that will help us when we get to full uh, WTP operations, uh, tank waste characterization and staging facility. We have some waste that uh, in the 177 tanks that, that are at the Hanford site that pose some specific problems. And um, we're going to be challenging to the pretreatment waste acceptance criteria, so we need this facility to help manage those. Um, we also had that briefed uh, in front of the Project Management Risk Committee. The uh, CD0 for that was approved this month. So bottom line is uh, we're embracing the Secretary's Project Management Initiative. Um, the, the other thing I would like to say is uh, teaming, going, I think Terry Mikowski mentioned that in, into teaming. Um, as the uh, head of the uh, tank waste program, one of the things I've been pushing for is to make sure there's discussion between the various projects. So when the, uh, John mentioned there was a project peer review uh, at Hanford on the waste treatment plant this week, been pushing to get people from the uh, salt waste processing facility on that. I've been pushing to get people from the waste treatment plant on the salt waste processing facility peer reviews. And then we've also reached back and tried to get folks from the uh, integrated waste treatment unit, which is no longer a project, but also to benefit from, from some of the experience that they've had on these projects. So with that, Peggy? Or do you, are you? Thank you, Ken. Well, the room is hot and the bar is probably not. So as the last speaker that stands between you and your evening engagement, I'm going to try to be uh, brief but meaningful. I um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, execution of major capital projects for DOE. Um, I've been the project director at WTP since July of 2013. And I, I know that many, many people in the room are very, very familiar with WTP, but I thought I shouldn't make the assumption that every single person was. Okay, one person, yes, okay. So um, with that, this is, um, this, here's what, what WTP looked like back in 2001. And here's where we are today. Ken actually showed the same picture on his slides. So WTP is a complex of facilities that will process 56 million gallons of waste that's stored in 177 underground tanks at Hanford. There are four major process facilities. First, there's the pretreatment, uh, commonly referred to as PT. So if I slip up and, and keep using my acronyms during this presentation, there's the high-level waste vitrification facility, the low-activity waste vitrification facility, and then there are some 22 balance of facility systems, electricity, water, compressed air that, that feed this complex. Um, WTP is a design-build contract. So a little bit about me. For those of you, I do know many people in the room, but for those of you that I haven't met, um, I've been nearly 27 years with Bechtel. Bechtel is a privately held firm, uh, currently operating with four business units, one of which is nuclear security and environment. Michael Graham's part of that, that business unit. And that's where we sit, uh, WTP sits in that business unit. I personally have been with Bechtel nearly 27 years. I thought about paying somebody to make that same remark that Scott Sachs got earlier, but I couldn't, I could, nobody would take my money. Um, before that, I was with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And just a few of the, the things that, on the, the journey that brought me to WTP in terms of experience, I spent three and a half years as the Deputy General Manager of Bechtel SAIC at Yucca Mountain. And, uh, and as the Manager of Operations, I had responsibility for stabilization and new safe confinement at Chernobyl, as well as the construction of the fissile material storage facility in Mayak, Russia. So what, first, I want to touch on safety and safety performance, because we absolutely believe all accidents are preventable. In 2014, we had the best safety performance in the history of the project. Uh, we, we were recertified with our VPP star status, and then we just recently were, were awarded the VPP star of excellence. And we're on track to have 
another record-breaking year in safety at WTP in 2015. So we're, we're working very hard to make that happen. Record-breaking meaning low. So, uh, okay, at the most fundamental level, successful projects depend on well-defined scope, stable requirements, successful partnering between the client and the customer that's appropriate to the form of contract between the two, and sufficient resources to accomplish the job. Now, by resources, I mean funding, qualified people, trained people, qualified vendors and subcontractors. And it's true that, uh, that uh, WTP certainly has had a number of impacts over the years, but I'm, I'm very p pleased and proud uh, to be able to point to the progress we've made, especially in light of those changes. Uh, in June of 2014, DOE authorized us to resume full production engineering on the HLW facility, high-level waste. We com that year, we completed 18 concrete placements because construction has continued in HLW in those areas unaffected by technical decisions. Uh, we declared our analytical laboratory ready for systemization. Uh, we completed the conceptual design of direct feed of waste to LAW, which uh, Ken actually covered in his slides. Uh, we completed phase one testing of the pulse jet mixer controls. And we completed the plan and schedule for resolving the pre-treatment facility technical decisions um, and placed the standby diesel generator for LAW. In 2015, we awarded the contract for the fabrication of the 16-foot standard high solids vessel, and, com and we completed negotiations and signed the contract modification for, th for the design effort associated with direct feed law. We're currently sitting at 25% complete on that design effort. We've completed the installation of the refractory for the two 300-ton melters for the LAW facility, and we're now working on the lids. And we began installation of the electrodes in the wet electrostatic precipitator. Uh, in 2015, we completed 22 con concrete placements in HLW. And last week, we turned over four utility systems from construction to startup. And we, we have begun the commissioning ramp, the pretty substantial commissioning ramp for LAW. So that staffing is, is increasing. So what's working well for us today at WTP? Well, we're, we're very fortunate to have good leadership in the Office of River Protection. Kevin Smith is the, is the manager of ORP and, and Bill Hamill, who's a federal project director. Um, they, they have taken a philosophy, as have we, of, of partnering with the customer and recognizing that it's, it's, uh, it's counterproductive to sit in internal meetings and complain about what other organizations are doing. We just need to get together and put it on the table and solve it. Um, they're demanding, but fair. And they are bringing that constructive oversight methodology that Frank Shepard referred to earlier in, in, the, uh, in the day that is so important. Uh, they are holding us to the requirements in the contract, not to expectations. I think that's a, that's a positive step. Uh, supply chain going well at, at WTP. And by that, I mean we've learned substantially um, about what we need to do to make our suppliers and subcontractors successful. And we're working very differently today with, with the supply chain than we did years ago. Embedded delivery teams in the shops, looking at quality, uh, embedded engineering to, to support them in the delivery of equipment. Before, now before we have a major piece of equipment that's shipped, we send a team in to check not only the equipment, but the paperwork. And it, it doesn't go on the boat unless it's, it's, it's ready for WTP. We just had our first ever um, supplier engagement forum in Richland where we brought, you know, we brought some 60 subcontractor suppliers in to talk about our systems and processes and what they need to do to be able to meet our requirements. I think that was a very productive step. And uh, Frank also talked about contract alignment uh, and how important that was. And so we are working with the department to hopefully realign the contract associated with direct fee law by the end of the year. In the meantime, that engineering effort has continued. Uh, and the other thing going well at WTP, which will never end, uh, we, we're starting to see both internally and externally the signs that our nuclear safety quality culture has taken a positive turn. Uh, our, our, our condition, uh, corrective action management program improvements, that included line accountability and engagement, new procedures, new tools, our safety conscious work environment training, and Leadership Academy is interesting. Somebody else earlier in the day talked about Leadership Academy that was very specific to their job. This Leadership Academy is a Bechtel Group, 
Leadership Academy because Bechtel has, has come to the realization that leadership matters and leadership can be taught. So um, forthright conversations, uh, lots of supervisory training, a real focus on management behaviors. And, and so we're getting some independent validation that those things are having their intended effect and we need, we need to continue on that journey. Our most recent assessment from the, uh, the DOE Office of Enterprise Assessment noted a marked improvement in how BNI personnel perceive the behaviors important for a healthy safety culture. So what are our challenges looking forward on this direct feed law mission? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the challenge on every single line item project that you'll see, funding stability. So it's not unique to WTP, but, uh, but, but it, is, it is one of our challenges and appreciate the, the efforts of Kevin and Bill to try to, to provide that for the project. Changing requirements, that's something we're dealing with on both ends, both uh, updated orders coming from the department as well as uh, consensus codes that are cited in our contract that vendors aren't working to anymore because, uh, because they're out of date. Uh, retention of our qualified and trained workforce, in particular as we complete the, the design and construction effort for LAW and the ability to take that trained and qualified workforce and roll it into the engineering production, procurement, and construction of HLW. And the continued use of national laboratories to, to build the technical basis that will allow the department to make decisions to proceed with the pretreatment facility. With that, um, that's, that's what I've got for you guys, so. work. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions uh, from the floor. Everybody's thirsty. <laughs> um, I know you shouldn't have done it. Um, I've got a couple questions. Um, a couple on WTP and, and maybe a, a couple for Ken on uh, uh, the wider uh, project management enterprise. I'll, I'll just a couple for you, um, Peggy. Um, Beyond the stability in funding, what do you see as the biggest risk posed to going uh, to WTP going forward? Change. You cannot complete any project until you stop making changes. So notwithstanding um, the great discussion we heard on the previous panel about the need to innovate and be looking for better ways, and we I think we have some leeway, in particular on pre-treat and HLW, but uh, the time is up for innovation on LAW. We need to we need to finish the facility and commission it. So that's that's what's most concerning to me because uh, that requires joint discipline between the, the the client and the contractor because it's it's not just change comes from many many sources including you know you got to get this, the engineers to stop making changes too. So I you know I have an issue of turning my own organization to completion and we're doing that. But change is. Uh, Change, I think, is our biggest challenge. Thanks. And I have a uh, question in kind of a similar vein for Ken. Um, uh, several years ago at WTP, one of the things, one of the challenges we had at WTP was en engaging a supply chain that could meet the NQA1 requirements, the rigorous nuclear safety codes and standards. Um, ha Ken, have, you mentioned that SWPF, that that was an, an what appears to be an isolated issue. Is there a broader concern um, going forward with these big, large capital projects that we'll see um, issues with the supply chain and in, in their ability to provide equipment to the standards that we need them to, given that you're, uh, we are eventually going to see uh, additional commercial power uh, construction and procurement activities? Um, yes. Uh, I'm not sure I mentioned it necessarily in the context of uh, SWPF. I think it was the salt disposal unit. But, but anyway, uh, certainly um, we've noticed a challenge in terms of the uh, vendor pipeline. Um, Frank may have talked about this morning, I don't know, about some vessels that we had there that uh, we had some problems with vendor quality and forced uh, a decision to change vendors to a different vendor. Um, several years ago, when I was in a different capacity uh, in EM, we actually held a uh, workshop, a QA workshop. Um, it wasn't necessary just for projects uh, where we 
got folks in across uh, the EM conference, uh, the complex. We actually had people from NNSA uh, come in as well. I think this was in Oak Ridge. And then we actually had somebody from the Nuclear Navy uh, talk about that. And then uh, prior to that, EM actually had some vendor forums. I don't remember the time frame. Folks in the audience may know better than I do. And actually, we've t I've gone in and talked to our QA safety folks and said, maybe we need to um, do that again, reinvigorate that effort, and perhaps have another. It sounds like Peggy did something. Uh, probably wasn't just QA. It was probably a, a whole number of things. But uh, we probably do need to see about that, because we certainly have noticed a uh, winnowing of the, uh, s the nuclear supply chain. And I, I don't. We, I think everybody expected it to ramp up a lot faster than it has, and it, re and it really hasn't. So, just one one other unintended cons consequence of uh, funding stability is one of the reasons suppliers are opting not to do business is because we start them, then we stop them, then we start them, then we stop them, and it's you know they're trying to plan their shop space. And, and we, we with, our, with these federal projects, we're competing with commercial business. And so it's a, it's a real challenge. I think that's why we have to bend over backwards to work with the, uh, the supplier community to keep them with us, because we can't do the job without them. We need them. I, is this working? I just had a quick question. Maybe we could chat afterwards so other people wouldn't be around. When, you are a build and construct design. So when do you anticipate this direct feed, the direct feed law going online? So Ken actually mentioned the date in his presentation. So the, the, the date, I believe, the target date that the department is using is um, December of 2022. And how much, will it, how much waste will that facility actually process? Um, I forget what the what the volume is to get to 30. Kevin, do you know? Well, to get to 30 gallon, uh, 30 metric tons per day. I don't know what the the gallons that no, that works I just off, I just mean how much of the hundred and of the 56 right. million gallons will be. It, it, it's sort of processed. dynamic too because we have some some waste going back to the tank farms. I think it's going to. 30%? OK. I think it also depends on when we get high-level waste and or pretreatment online as, as well. So there's a number of factors that uh, would uh, impact what, what the actual amount would be. We do know that it does work off. It helps to work off the, uh, while it's operating, which is the important thing, the, some of the uh, supernate volume. Let me ask a, a question about the 413 process. Uh, with the WIP project, uh, we don't see that as being horribly sophisticated. It's not a black box like uh, some of the other big projects that are going on in the complex. And I think everyone in the complex would like to get WIP open as quickly as possible. But part of the problem, uh, of course, when you're going through the, the CD process, is coordinating that with the budget process in Congress. And so how, how, do, we, uh, how, how do we deal with that in terms of a, a shorter window? This isn't a 20-year project. This is a, a much shorter project. Uh, we would view there's nothing magic about it. We, we mine drifts. We, uh, we've got four shafts. We know how to do those things. We know how to put filters in on the surface. We know, know all of those kinds of things. So now it becomes a, a question of how we coordinate with funding. So to a large degree. So how do we get through that process in a more reasonable period of time? Um, actually, uh, that's not my, my area. So I'm going to pass a little bit on that. But other than to say, uh, and I don't know if Monica mentioned this this morning, but, but getting WIP 
we started is certainly one of our highest priorities. And uh, I can tell you that we're working to, to get the funding to um, make that happen as soon as uh, it's practical, given that we have other things we have to do, but to get it up and operating safely. So maybe John can add something. Let me just add to that and some of the things that Peggy was talking about as well, because this issue of um, having an uncertain funding stream, I mean, I, I know and I relate from private sector, is, is a very real problem in project development. And we see that throughout our projects. Uh, certainly that the contractors uh, uh, feel this way, and, and they're right. Uh, it's uh, anytime you're, first of all, anytime you're suboptimally funding a project, you're increasing the total project cost. and. You know, having developed projects myself, I know that it just creates enormous number of, uh, of uh, backups. Uh, I, Peggy's comment about it's time to stop the changes and get on with the damn project was a point she made uh, last week in Hanford, and I, I loved it then, and you told a good story about another project that you'd worked on in the past. Um, this, this specific issue about WIP that you're talking about also, uh, um, sorry, I'm down here behind the, the podium, but um, you know, is, is it important and a fair point? Um, uh, unfortunately, we're not Congress, um, and uh, so we deal with these issues as well. Congress has a very important uh, oversight role, uh, clearly, um, and, uh, um, but it is difficult. We spend a lot of time trying to coordinate uh, through uh, Office of Management and Budget and with Congress to try to deal with these issues, but uh, the reality is the types of issues you're talking about do exist and they're very hard to fix. Um, WIP, in, in particular, <coughs> is, a, a, as you know, obviously a vitally important uh, facility for the department. Um, and we did have um, uh, an incident there which has is, which is put us down. We're, we're uh, very confident that we're on the track to uh, resuming activities, uh, more or less on our schedule. Uh, but it is very important that we do so um, and, and make sure that we maintain safety. And we will obviously not sacrifice safety. Uh, for any for any schedule, so uh, that's been a particularly uh, sensitive project for that reason. Um, but uh, you, you're correct that these are difficult is issues that we do try to manage. One more. I'm going to answer your question, and Peggy, I was with Bechtel from '68 to '84 before your time. The problem we saw after that, uh, or during that time, was after Three Mile, and the number of qualified vendors that we had that were NQA qualified were very well capable of doing an excellent job that we need today. And the fact that just recently, while I was in Montana on my way uh, to the site at Hanford, uh, I ran into a couple of fellows at the Salt Lake City who were catching a connecting flight, and they were welders heading to Hanford because you couldn't find the welders up there. Qualified welders are the keynote to the work. One of the things that, that you didn't mention is that I want to ask you about is what happened to the transfer lines from the tank farms to the pretreatment plant? Nobody mentioned anything about the seven miles of pipeline. So we pick up the waste at the fence line for WTP, so maybe that's a, maybe that's a question better uh, Answered by Ken or, or Kevin. <laughs> so, we're still friends, Ken. <laughs> so wouldn't you say what happened to them? Yeah, there was a problem with the pipeline, the transfer lines coming from tank farms going towards the waste treatment plant. I'm uh, not, not aware of, of so what those are. Kevin. Kevin will talk. Kevin. Kevin, were you, were you going to? Oh, oh, very good. Uh, any additional questions? I hope, I'm really glad this didn't devolve into a discussion on NQA1 and vendor standards and that kind of stuff. Anyway, thank you for your time. This is the last session for the day. Um, appreciate it. Thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow.